Welcome to the Allegheny East Conference of Churches. Hey, welcome everyone. This evening, we will have Claudia coming to us again. I know you had a great time today. I like sitting high like this. And you know, matter of fact, when we're high up like this, it almost seems like nothing can defeat us. As we go for the rest of this week, I want you to share this with someone, share this with someone you love, and make sure this evening, all of your friends will get all this good news. Remember now, we got Claudia coming up. Listen carefully and share this again with someone. Peace, everybody. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your loving kindness and for your tender mercies. We are so grateful that we were able to worship with you, with each other virtually. And we pray that as we're preparing to hear the word, that you would prepare our hearts and our minds, that you will prepare your manservant. Fill him with your spirit, oh God. Fill him with your love. I pray that you give him a word for us, that whatever it is that we need, um, whatever breakthroughs, whatever answers, whatever rebukes that we need, God, I pray that you would do it through him. Thank you so much for your many blessings. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.
to camp? You ready to camp? Listen, Master Guy is coming up soon, you know. That's right. That's so I right. hope you got your gear all packed and ready That's to right. go. We got Master Guide camping coming up. Actually, it's going to be up here. Yeah, one of them's going to be up okay, here. Okay, one's going to be up here. Okay, tell us what's going on with our Pathfinders, Adventurers, and um, and our Master Guys. First of all, let's just start with Master Guy because you know they are the they are the master guys listen let's I, we gotta say we got about maybe 30 pastors coming up mm -hmm. that's doing their master guys they're coming out strong great classes great yes. um discussions that we're having on there but we still want everybody not only to be master guys those who who are not doing it anymore um we want them to be active again get active oh, yeah. yes because okay. we have our i mean we got our kids our goal is always to save our kids that's right and if you have those tools as a master guy, we want to make sure you use them. So if you're interested in being a part of the Master Guy Club or just doing something in your church or even in our conference, just contact us and let us know so we could pass that information along. Yeah. Then we have our Pathfinders. Listen, as the, when the pandemic came through, we started a conference Pathfinder uh, Club. club. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we did it, wait, didn't we call it the Eagles? The Eagles, it's called that's called the right. Eagles, that's right? right? The reason why we started that is because, you know, we got hit pretty hard over the pandemic. And, and, and we did lose some of our, our leaders. That's right, and some of our leaders, leaders also. So what we're doing right now is, uh, if you're not uh, in a Pathfinder Club, just hit us online, right? Um, and uh, at www. Uh, AECYCM. AECYCM. <laughs> or visit AEC.org. Everything is there on the youth ministry page so that if your child is not connected, they're not connected to uh, a club right now, they could be co connected to the Allegheny East Eagles. The right. We're coming club to the end have. of the club year, but when we start back in September, if your church doesn't have it because of leadership issues or you just need somewhere to go, just call us, come on our website, and get connected. That's right. We also have similar with the Adventurer Club. Right. Share, share what we do with the Adventurer well, Club. One thing I like about the even the Pathfinders have this too. The Adventurer Club, uh, they have certain churches that's coming together to mm -hmm. work as one club mm -hmm. during the pandemic. Very important. We're on Zoom. We're doing cert they're doing certain activities. We still want you to be a part of. Even though it seems like we're coming out of the pandemic, we don't know what's going to happen. So what we're going to do, we're going to still continue the activities within the Adventurer Club. And um, if, if, if it has fallen off at your church because of it right now, we're still available to make sure that they move up in their classes. Definitely. We want to make sure our children them. are safe right. and we want to make sure that they have something to do. That's right. That's right. Listen, mm -hmm. you know, when I came first, the big talk was about Ashka. That's right. That's right. No, no That's we right. know we had some changes. And in a couple of months, we're supposed to be going and do a site visit on the new place. But let's just share a little bit with the new the venue new place. okay <laughs> for, all right for, so for i remember coming in with uh i can remember colorado pennsylvania back in the day now we're here at oskosh and they have picked a new venue which right. is gillette wyoming. wyoming wyoming gillette wyoming horses all right so <laughs> um we're going to be out there next week pray for us as we go out there to pick our plot pick oh, our spots right. and, and we're going to be looking around at what's going on but we want everyone to be a part of that that means we need you to start saving, saving. now okay mm -hmm. start saving up right now because it's on the other side of the world right. that we're going to at this time but i'm, I'm grateful it's going to have a, a, it's going to have a great time when do we go to wyoming right so we want everyone to be ready for that but this is one thing I want everybody to know, that we have everything from Oshkosh now becomes collector's items. Right. All right. Allegheny East has always had the best hats, the best jackets, the yes. best all of that. And so what we're going to do at the end of this, we're going to show you a couple of pictures of the stuff that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can order them. We have quite a few that's left yeah, over that you can get. And we want to make sure that you have mm -hmm. them. We have the hats. The jackets. We, the jackets. We even right. have the visors. The visors, right. And right. we want to make sure that you have your Oshkosh gear so that when we go over into Gillette, we'll know that you have collector's items, okay? So this is where we are? That's it. Hey, look at the grounds. This is where everybody's supposed to be, but we're grateful. Remember, our children come first. Do not, this thing is about undefeated. That's right. right? That's and when, right. And when and our president chose this thing, that's right. Us. Not no, gonna do, not going to defeat us. Ministry. Not going to defeat us. And so we want everybody, remember, even though we have 13, 14 ministries in youth ministry, please remember our children in these three. Pathfinders, Adventures. Adventurers, and our teens, TLT we just started, right? right? Yes, I got our TLTs, but, and our master guides, okay? Everybody, just continue to pray for us. Make sure our ministries will always be at the top. God bless you. Real good.
who you are. Come on and lift your hands. Help me celebrate God for his great grace. Yeah. I know the grace that you poured on the world to save us from what we become was the same grace when you looked upon us and called us your daughter as your son. It's the same grace. It's the same grace. It's the same grace. Grace. Sing it one more time. I know the grace that you saved us from what was the same grace. You looked upon us and called us your daughter as your son. It's the same grace, yeah. Everybody say, it's the same grace. Grace, It's the same grace. And it's sufficient for me. It's the same grace. Covering all of my same grace. Hey! It is sufficient. It's the same grace. Yeah! Thank you, Lord, covering all same grace. Oh! It's the same grace. Yeah! God's great grace, grace that is greater, grace that is great, it's your grace, your grace, exceeding abundance, your grace. hung bled and died for me so thank you lord thank you lord for grace grace so now thank you all i need great grace thank you lord for saving me for bathing me in your grace, yeah, oh, yeah, grace, grace, great grace, oh, it's the same grace, great grace. Good evening. It is such a privilege to be back with you, sharing and growing with you at this year's virtual camp meeting, learning about how we are undefeated in Jesus Christ. Now on Sabbath, we looked at Romans chapter eight and how we have an undefeated hope in the person of Jesus Christ, that no matter what tests and trials come your way, our hope is undefeated. And tonight we're going to look at the story of Hagar and understand what it means to have undefeated faith. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, verse 16. Genesis chapter 16, I'm sorry, 
verse 1. And you might be watching me on your phone or your laptop, but I, I still like reading from the printed text of the Bible. I'm going to read in your hearing from Genesis chapter 16, beginning at verse 1. And the word of the Lord says that Abram's wife, Sarai, had not born any children for him, but she owned an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Sarai said to Abram, since the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, go to my slave. Perhaps through her, I can build a family. And Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So Abram's wife, Sarai, took Hagar, her Egyptian slave, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as a wife for him. This happened after Abram had lived in the land of Canaan 10 years. He slept with Hagar and she became pregnant. When she saw that she was pregnant, her mistress became contemptible to her. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for my suffering. I put my slave in your hands. And when she saw that she was pregnant, I became contemptible to her. May the Lord judge between me and you. Abram replied to Sarai, here is your slave in your hands. Do whatever you want with her. Then Sarai mistreated her so much that she ran away from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. He said to her, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She replied, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord then said to her, go back to your mistress and submit to her authority. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your offspring and they will be too many to count. The angel of the Lord said to her, you have conceived and will have a son. You will name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your cry of affliction. This man will be like a wild donkey. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him. He will settle near all his relatives. So the place, so she named the Lord who spoke to her. You are El Roi, for she said in this place, have I actually seen the one? who sees me. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we pray that you lead and guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1983, Alice Walker published her collection, uh, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, Womanist Prose. Composed of 36 individual pieces, Walker includes everything from essays and speeches to reviews and articles, specifically highlighting the experience of black women in America and her social theory, womanism. Now, in the essay named for the collection, Walker begins with a jarring poetics, forcing the reader to face the truth behind black women's pain. She writes, quote, black women whose spirituality was so intense, so deep, so unconscious that they were themselves unaware of the richness they held. They stumbled blindly through their lives, creatures so abused and mutilated in body, so dimmed and confused by pain that they considered themselves unworthy even of hope, end quote. Walker dialogues with the reader, asking them to query how a woman so abused could ever have the space to engage and exercise her creativity. Furthermore, Walker argues that it is by looking at our mother's gardens that we find where and how they held on to and produced their art. She suggests, in fact, that it is in sifting through their soil and perusing through their perennials, beholding their beauty in bloom, that we find Black women's art. In other words, our mothers and grandmothers and great-great-grandmothers, they may have been forbidden to write poetry. They may have never been given the tools to paint masterpieces or had time to sculpt our greatest statues. But when we look at their gardens and when we look at their quilts and when we look at the everyday things their hands were, were both forced and chose to do, it is there that we find their art. And most importantly, it is in finding the beauty of our mother's gardens that we come to a greater understanding of our own art. This evening, 
Walker's analysis of the black woman's experience on American soil has me pondering a different question. It has sent me in search of different answers. Tonight, I want to know how did black women bear 15 children and see all of them sold and still hold on to God? I want to know tonight, how did black women pick pounds of cotton and still possess a praise on their lips? How did black women arise after being brutally raped and still believe in the blessed presence of a benevolent and ever-present God? See, this evening, I am not in search of our mother's creativity. Tonight, I am in search of our mother's faith. For how can a black woman be seen and used as the mule of the world, in the words of Zora Neale Hurston, and still have faith in God? How have black women been able to have an undefeated faith? I believe the answer to this question is found not in our mother's gardens, not in the beauty they create, not in the art they compose, but rather this answer is found in a dedicated search after our mother's deserts. In order to understand the faith of a survivor, you cannot look at their bloom. You've got to sit with them in their desolation. Black women have sat in the desert of slavery, poverty, sexual and economic exploitation, surrogacy, rape, domestic violence, homelessness, motherhood, single parenting, the theft of mind, body, and soul at the hands of white men and white women, black men and black women by themselves. This entity created in the very image of God sits in ashes as the most disrespected, the most unprotected, and the most neglected person in America, according to Malcolm X. And if we are ever going to understand their faith, if we're ever going to gain lessons from them on the person of God, then we must search for and sit in our mother's deserts forever going to understand what it means to have an undefeated faith. We've got to sit in our mother's deserts. And in Genesis 16, we are introduced to an African woman who, according to Dolores Williams in her book, Sisters in the Wilderness, in a, in a matter of verses, just finds herself enslaved, impoverished, sexually and economically exploited and raped, all while serving as the surrogate to her mistress's husband. A responsibility that will cause her to become a homeless single parent. Commonly known to us as Hagar Williams suggests that it is critical that we acknowledge her African heritage because such attention addresses the quote African references in scripture that Western biblical scholarship has heretofore ignored and thus made invisible. And the truth is, it is our neglect of the African ancestry of Hagar. It is in our glossing over of her narrative, her presence in the tapestry of Abraham and Sarah's story, that we participate in the perpetual silencing and invisibility of black women in the Bible and ultimately in our own lives. See, family, if you cannot see Hagar in the scriptures, then you cannot see black women and girls in the scriptures. And if you can't see black women and girls in the scriptures, then they can't argue that the scriptures aren't for them. And if they can argue that the scriptures are not for them, then they can assume that the God of the scriptures wants nothing to do with them. In other words, in order for our black women and girls to understand that God is a God for colored girls, in order for them to see how God interacts with colored girls uh, in order for them to see that God does miracles for colored girls, uh, colored girls who've been raped, uh, colored girls who've been banished, uh, colored girls who've been used, uh, colored girls who've been neglected, then we've got to search for the deserts uh, of the colored girls in the Bible. It's in the story of Hagar that we are confronted with the traumatic wilderness experience of a black woman in scripture. Starting in verse one, we immediately learn that Sarai has reached old age and has been unable to bear her husband, Abram, any children. Having been given a promise by God in Genesis 12 that Abram would father many nations, Sarai grows frustrated and offers her slave to her husband. 
Verse two says, since the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, go to my slave. Perhaps through her, I can build a family. The language here is critical. Sarai does not suggest that Abram can fulfill God's promise with another woman. It is not that Abram would take Hagar as his wife and the promise of Abram fathering many nations would now consist of them being mothered by Hagar. No, what we see here is the owner property dynamic that is central to any form of enslavement. See, Hagar did not own her own body. Whatever happened to the outside or the inside of her being was the sole responsibility, determination, and property of Abram and Sarai, but Sarai specifically. In fact, Will DeGaffney in her book, Womanist Midrash, a reintroduction to the women of the Torah and the throne, she writes this, quote, Hagar has no say over her body being given to Abram or her child being given to Sarai. Ah, Hagar is on the underside of all of the power curves in operation at that time, as noted by Renita Weems, Dolores Williams, and many, many others. She is female, foreign, enslaved. She has one source of power. She is fertile, but she lacks autonomy over her own fertility, end quote. And black women, many of us know what it feels like for your only power to be your fertility, but you even lack the agency to control and protect that. Whether the breeding practices of slavery, the sterilization practices of the early 20th century or human sex trafficking in our present, black women and girls are still trapped, fulfilling the surrogate and sexual needs of masters and mistresses they did not choose. So often I've heard sermons family where the preachers have tried to suggest some sort of connection between Hagar and Abram that for some odd reason upon conception all of a sudden now Hagar develops contempt for Sarai because of her infertility and I just got one question why would an enslaved black woman develop contempt for a barren mistress just because she couldn't get pregnant (laughs) I don't think this is a proper read. In fact, I think theologian Dr. Gaffney has a much better interpretation. See, she queries, what if Hagar's contempt and disposition towards Hagar, uh, what if uh, towards Sarai is wrapped up in her anger that Sarai has used and exploited her for her own reproductive desires? And this is where the word gets hard. Black women are the backbone of the black church without their volunteering the ministries and efficacy of the black church and subsequently the black preacher and pastor would be null and void. And right now we are in a time when black women hold a deep contempt for the church and its leaders and people continually try to explain away our disposition as burnout. They try to explain away our disposition as spiritual fatigue, a distraction from the enemy. When what if the truth is that black women Women's distasteful disposition towards the church and its leaders right now is due to the fact that we've been tasked with bearing the brunt of its reproductive desires along with your contempt at our fertility. See, you want black women volunteering for the evangelistic series but not preaching it. You want black women organizing the community events but not leading it. You want black women giving the Bible studies but not baptizing. You want black women reproducing for the church. And when she does, you grow angry at her fertility and your anger towards us, your disapproval of us, your exploitation of us, your mistreatment of us. That is what has birthed our content for you. Not your inability to preach, not your poor planning skills. Our contempt for the church has less to do with its infertility and more to do with its exploitation and theft of our fertility. You have us birthing ministries and initiatives to build the nation you believe God has promised you and you take what we have birthed, you name it, and we get no credit for the labor or nursing. We get no attention to the trauma of your sexual advances in planning meetings, no 
recognition for the behind the scenes preparation we've given to your programs, nothing but contempt for our fertility. And the Bible says that after Sarai complained about Hagar to Abram, that her husband permitted her to do whatever she felt was necessary to her slave. So the Bible says then Sarai mistreated her so much that she ran away from her. And the truth is black women have been so mistreated by the church that they are running away from her. And we don't want to acknowledge this. We keep demanding that the abused remain in the clutches of her master under the whip of her pastor, subject to the ridicule of parishioners. And yet there is no rebuke. The Abrams of the church merely let these people say and do whatever they want. And we wonder why black women are leaving the Christian church for African ancestral religions and witchcraft. I read an article about a Seventh-day Adventist young girl who left the church and now is practicing African witchcraft. It's a proud worshiper. The Bible says the angels of the Lord found her by a spring in the wilderness the spring on the way to shore. She said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? Hagar replied, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. Now this is where the text gets difficult for us. The angel of the Lord said to her, go back to your mistress and submit to her authority. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your offspring and they will be too much, too many to count. You have conceived and you will have a son. You will name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard your cry of affliction. This man will be like a wild donkey. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him. He will settle near all his relatives in the verse that I love the most. So she named the Lord who spoke to her. You God are El Roy. For she said in this place. Have I actually seen the one who sees me? Dolores Williams writes, quote, The fact that Hagar returned to the household of her slave owner after her self-initiated liberation demonstrates her faith and her radical obedience to her God, end quote. Hear me, black women. While we have been abused and misused and exploited by the very church that we've been called to serve, God has not released us. In verses 9 and 10, when God calls Hagar to return to Sarai, her mistress, if we take this metaphor of Hagar as black women and Sarai as the church, then God is calling us to stay. God is calling us to return. The question is why? Why would God call you to stay? in a church that does not value your contributions? Why would he tell you to stay in a church that exploits your gifting? Why would God tell you to stay in a church that abuses your body? Why would God tell you to stay in a church that seeks to use you for its own perverse and misguided reproductive needs? And the answer is that the abuse that you're experiencing has birthed you your love for God. It has birthed in you your liberation and it has birthed in you your lineage. In verse 13, the Bible says that God names, uh, Hagar names God El Roy or the God who sees. Now what is so powerful and significant about this moment in scripture is that this black woman comes to an understanding of God, not in her master's house under his teaching, not in the beauty and success of her family. Hagar comes to an understanding of God in the desert, the desert of sure, the desert of abuse, the desert of exploitation, the desert of poverty, the desert of neglect. And if we're going to come to a place where we find the kind of intimacy with God that causes us to name them for ourselves, the kind of intimacy with God that causes us to recognize their presence and power in our lives, the kind of intimacy with God that births within us an undefeated faith, then we have to look to God in our mother's deserts. We've got to look for the ways God showed up in your mother's abuse, in the way that God 
showed up in your grandmother's exploitation, in the way that God showed up in your great grandmother's poverty, who was God to your mothers when they were in their desert? That is when you come to a knowledge of who God is, when you're in your desert. Our faith It's shaking right now. Our belief is waning right now. But the only way that we will be able to connect with God and hold on is if we search for God in our deserts. When we search for God in our deserts, we are given the strength and sustenance we need to return to our assignment. We are given what we need to have an undefeated faith. This is critical because as we see in the text, Hagar returns to the camp of Abram and Sarai and raises her son Ishmael alongside their son Isaac. Ultimately, Sarai's contempt for Hagar and Ishmael grows so much so that she is unwilling for Hagar to receive any of the provision and care of Abram. Regardless of the fact that her contempt for Hagar's fertility is her own fault as she forced, forced Hagar to sleep with her husband. Sent away to the wilderness with no real provision or support, Hagar and Ishmael are basically sent to the wilderness to die. And what we see in this moment is that Hagar receives her liberation and her lineage. In Genesis 21, 18, the Bible records the cries of Hagar and Ishmael in the desert. And God responds declaring, what's wrong, Hagar? Don't be afraid. For God has heard the boy crying from the place where he is. Get up, help the boy, and grasp his hand, for I will make him a great nation. Hear me. The very thing that you birthed in captivity, the very thing that you birthed in abuse and exploitation, that very thing is what God in his time is going to use to both free you and establish a long lasting lineage on your behalf. Black women, we serve a God who sees, a God who desires to speak to us in the most intimate spaces, the most broken areas of our lives. And this God desires that we know that they see us, that they hear us. Us, that our abuse is not lost on them. See, you might be feeling used and neglected and cast to the side in your nation, in your community, in your home, in your church, but the God we serve is a God who sees colored girls. The God we serve is a God who speaks to colored girls. The God we serve is a God who serves colored girls. The God we serve is a God who saves Saves, colored girls. I know you're in your desert, but be not dismayed. Whatever be tied, God will take care of you. I know you're in your desert, but fear not, for wherever the sole of your foot treads upon, God will be with you. I know you're in your desert, but trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. I know you're in your desert. But freedom is coming. Joy is coming. Healing is coming. Restoration is coming. Salvation is coming. We can have undefeated faith like Hagar because we serve an undefeated champion. Our God sees us. It's because our God sees us that we can have. In undefeated faith. Family, let's pray together. Holy Spirit, you are better to us than we have been to ourselves. Right now, we come into your presence, God, thanking you for being the God who sees, thanking you that in spite of all of the brokenness and in spite of all of the pain and in spite of everything that we're going through, God, you are committed to seeing us. So God, because we know you are committed to us, we can have an undefeated faith regardless of what is happening to and around us. Thank you for being a God that we can rely on. It's in Jesus' name I pray this. Amen.